uh, go back on it on YouTube. Welcome everybody. I'm very happy to be here today and uh, at this event. This is a round table hosted by the Santana Legal Studies. I will be your chair. My name is Filippo Fontanelli, but all the credits for the organization of today go to the directors of the Santana Legal Studies, uh, uh, Giuseppe Martinico and Giacomo delle Donne. Giuseppe in particular. Giuseppe in particular has put together this stellar team of speakers uh, that just joined us. I hope he can hear us as well. And uh, the stellar uh, panel of speakers will convene around one theme and one topic, which is uh, this book right here, China and the WTO, Why Multilateralism Matters, written by Petros Mavroidis, whom we have with us, and Andre Sapir. Uh, this is a very dense session. So, we need to be uh, very disciplined. Petros, of course, will go first and speak for about 20 minutes. The other speakers in turn will react for about 10 minutes each. Then we will open the discussion to everybody else. Uh, I will recommend everybody who is not speaking at the moment to mute the microphones, uh, but otherwise we invite everybody to speak in good order. Now, our first speaker of the day, and uh, in the meanwhile, I invite Petros to get the presentation ready, is Professor Petros Mavroides from Columbia Law School. He is a longtime friend of Santana since 2006, and a few years ago, presumably to live closer to Santana and to the nearby city of Livorno, spent some years in Tuscany taking the university institute, the European University Institute uh, by storm and generating single-handedly a generation of stellar international trade lawyers, some of whom are in the audience today. He insisted that I cite his love for Fiorentina Football Club, which I believe is a smart distraction from the real question we all have for him, which is, Will you support Italy or Switzerland tonight? We don't know the answer to that. Now, uh, today he will present this book and the theme that inspired him and the co-author to write it. So, Petros, whenever you're ready, take it away. You have 20 sono, minutes from now. Sono nato pronto. Eh, yeah, grazie Pepo e grazie Bepaccio per l'invito, è sempre un grande piacere di tornare a Sant'Anna, alla scuola di mio carissimo amico Carocci, chi non è con noi adesso, però la vita è così. So, I'll speak in English from now on. Um, um, the book, oops, now this is the book, well, uh, yeah, and this is the argument in a few sentences. So, Andre and myself, we started thinking about, um, actually wanted to ask one question. China has done well, has developed very fast, post accession to the WTO, trade-wise and otherwise. But the question is, has it done so uh, in a manner consistent with the obligations it assumed under the WTO? And instead of getting into too much detail and too much philosophical inquiries, we said, okay, Let's take the grievances list for granted. So we will not uh, say the US or EU or whoever is right or wrong, we'll say what do they complain about? And in a nutshell, they complain about state involvement in the workings of the economy in China, predominantly through state-owned enterprises and transfer of technology. And the question is, is this Chinese state involvement in harmony, harmonious with the world trading system as we know it? So the question we ask in this book is, okay, in light of those grievances, what can you do within the WTO so that China first in accordance both with the letter and the spirit of the multilateral trading system? I'll do four, uh, I divide my talk into four, let's say, uh, chapters. The first is the terms of accession of China, because quite frankly, I've seen, and that's one reason why we wrote the book, all sorts of things about what China has agreed to, 
when it joined the WTO. So in the book, we paid particular attention to the letter of the protocol of accession. Then the issues where I told you we take the grieve, like a cahier de doléances for granted. Then how much you can achieve within the current regime. And then what could or should be done in order to advance uh, this type of complaints. Now, China enters the WTO. Of course, Andre and myself, and now we speak in hindsight 2020. Yeah, we're Monday morning quarterbacks because we started writing this book two and a half, three years ago. Uh, that is 17 years, 18 years after China had joined the WTO. Um, well, China joins, accepts all multilateral contracts, GATT, GATT, TRIPS, DSU, promises to negotiate accession to government procurement. Never happened. I mean, so far hasn't happened. And also concludes a protocol of accession, which, in our view, does not impose additional hard disciplines, transformative disciplines, but is the area where you will find the substantive and substantial tariff cuts that China agreed to. The proof, we say, does not impose any other additional hard disciplines is that if you look at case disputes against China, well, the provision you will be, you'll find, for example, in SOE related dispute is section 15, and which is innocuous and nothing more. Now, the protocol of accession nudges China towards further reform, but does not impose, and I'll come back into this point, why it does not impose in a moment. Now, why no more? Well, I mean, if we go back, we want to avoid presentism, if we go back to 2001 when China joins the WTO, we check the record of discussions before the US Congress more than any other record, because it is by far the most transparent record. Uh, we found discussions in Europe, of course, as well, but in the US, you have a wealth of information. Well, many people were very happy, and they are, the classic argument was, look, I mean, don't be stupid here. We keep our duties where they are. They will agree to meaningful tariff bindings and reduction. This should lead us to a trade surplus. The world is a happy place for the US. And then there were additional voices saying, look, I mean, China, we know, has embarked on a one-way street to become a market economy. By the way, they even imposed the date, 2015, by which China would no longer be considered a non-market economy. So in 2000, they said in 15 years, you'll be treated like anybody else. But then there were even voices that said not only a market economy, but a liberal democracy. This is unavoidable for China. And of course, it's still the end of the 90s. We're still at the apex of liberalism. Uh, the end of history, Fukuyama, we say, well, this is the way things will happen from now on. Now, against this background, what are the issues nowadays concerning China's participation? And in one sentence, we think that the issues pertain much more to the spirit of the protocol of accession rather than the letter. And I will explain this point now here. First of all, China did extremely well. I mean, unprecedented growth, unprecedented speed, whether the 2008 financial crisis better than most, I mean, definitely than EU-US, without becoming a Western economy as WTO incumbents understand the term and hope China would become. But the question that people ask in both sides of the Atlantic and more and more with more and more strength now in Brussels is, the role of state in China. This is the bone of contention. Is this consistent with WTO? And uh, we checked the, um, um, the, the complaints both before the WTO's formal disputes, but also before various WTO committees. And the two outstanding complaints are the role of SOEs and transfer of technology. There is an additional complaint for under enforcement of the contract against China, but this, I mean, you can hardly, I mean, it, maybe you can, but it would be very difficult to accuse China for under enforcement. And anyway, what is the benchmark for, I mean, if we knew the appropriate number of disputes, we did a paper with Henrik and essentially Hoka Nordstrom idea 20 years ago, and we used this uh, benchmark, uh, the share of international trade. But this assumes a number of things, and one of the things it assumes is 
the propensity to um, encounter an illegal trade barrier is symmetric across players. By that benchmark, if that benchmark is correct, yes, there is under enforcement, but once again, there's nothing you can do about those things, or very little, if at all. Now, the other very important uh, point is that China complies with adverse rulings. Every time I was participated in discussions and in conferences during the last three years when we were preparing the book with André, and I heard people saying, oh, China does not comply, the question that we asked was, what are the cases? And they all point one case where you can make the argument that China did not fully comply. But overall, China has not behaved worse than any other WTO member, especially not the big two, the EU and the US, who have a history of non-implemented, big non-implemented cases. So implicitly the argument is WTO cannot deal with China because if it could, <laughs> well, anytime you take China to the court, you China implements. So why is it the case? And that's the question we ask in the book. Now, why the current regime cannot address the two stated concerns I mentioned? There are limits in the existing regime. Now, we uh, disaggregate now transfer of technology and SOEs. And I'll come back to this discussion later again in three, four minutes. But here is just a brief a sneak preview, if you wish. The long and the short concerning transfer of technology is that here the majority of complaints concern private agents' behavior. Now, in China, of course, there are woofers, the wholly owned foreign companies, so on and so forth. That's true. But there are also companies which, uh, unless uh, unless if you have an agreement, a joint venture with Chinese company, you cannot enter into the Chinese market. And the comp usual complaint is, ah, but these guys, they request transfer of technology. Fine. I'm not saying it... I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Maybe it does happen. There is some proof. A number of scholars, especially investigative journalists, have come up with a lot of information about these things. But all I'm saying is something that many people have done in the past, uh, including uh, the transatlantic partners. Moreover, uh, if it is, uh, let's say, anathema now for us, which maybe it is, uh, still there's nothing much you can do against Chinese companies requesting transfer of technology because unless if you attribute this behavior to the Chinese state, this is private action, stays outside the WTO um, uh, legislative arsenal. Now, when it comes to SOEs, admittedly, things could have been handled better, but to a large extent, uh, uh, I would say, I would start with the last point, the WTO judges did not benefit from a very clear legislative mandate. That's, I have to acknowledge and give it to them, but within the confines of an imperfect legislative mandate, they managed to eviscerate totally the discipline, discipline concerning state trading enterprises under Article 17 and make a total mess out of SOEs in the context of subsidies. They went from 100% uh, owned enterprises are not in public bodies to private uh, Agents can be regarded uh, public bodies if you can show not behavior, but structural links, all sorts of crazy things. Now, the two key points I think in the book is come in the, the, the next slide. The first is why is the multilateral regime wanting? And here we make three points. The first point we make is, first of all, that the GATT was predicated on an implicit liberal understanding, discussed among others, or principally in Polanyi, Raggi, and Tunglier, who was the chief economist of the, of the GATT in 1984, who, probably the clearest statement. The, the idea of embedded liberalism. I mean, FDR, he was in power on the one hand, uh, and this is why the US even eventually they ended up with, first of all, with weak disciplines on subsidies in the GATT, and then with a waiver for subsidies in 55, the idea was, I will take care of my own through subsidization. I will guarantee full employment in the post-World War or as close to full employment as possible post-WW2 era against liberalization of international trade. Article 17 was thought as an exception state trading enterprises within systems with well-defined property rights, functioning competition laws, etc. Now, um, we have in the book a lot of information concerning state trading enterprises in Europe and the US and how they function. 
uh, essentially they cannot undo markets. This is the kind of this is the area where uh, EU US on the one hand and China on the other hand are two ships passing by in the night. Now, why was the gap was a relational contract? There was they felt no need to be explicit on things that everybody was following anyway. So the liberal understanding remained implicit. As the membership became heterogeneous, some of it was translated into codes, but then the Berlin Wall falls, everybody signs to the codes. Now, whatever had been uh, um, already agreed in the course, ah, now we're starting turning the page, everybody agrees this is the way to go forward. Maybe there is no need to impose it on China either because they are, as I said before, on the way to mend anyway. And the, the third point we make in this context, which is towards the most telling, is that the Obama administration, with a little bit more information because they come into play after China had acceded to the WTO 2008, they realize the change, the change in China has not happened, so they do what the Uruguay round negotiators did not do. They negotiate an agreement that concerns China without China, the TPP, and they have a super elaborate discipline, both on transfer of technology and state-owned enterprises, the kind of stuff that is missing from the Uruguay round agreements. And remember, China makes accessions that it wants to join in 86. As of 87, we have the working group, which means for the best part of the Uruguay round, everybody knows that China will accede. And still the SEM agreement does not even mention state-owned enterprises. Why didn't we the wedding to incumbents, incumbents add to the protocol of accession? Well, for the simple reason that protocols of accession are not open season. Uh, you cannot start doing in the protocol of accession, moving to areas not covered by the WTO. Private behavior, international investment, which is key for addressing transfer of technology, is not part of the WTO portfolio. And then when it comes to subsidies, some activities by subsidies, if acknowledged as public bodies, would be easier to handle. Maybe they could have added a sentence to the effect, SOEs are public bodies, but some activities cannot be handled at all. China subsidizes, for example, subsidiaries in Egypt. There is a case before the European Union now. This is not part of the SEM agreement because the SEM agreement addresses only subsidies by states to private agents within their territory. These unilateral actions are of dubious consistency, and maybe one day we'll see a case against the EU on this point in the not too distant future. Um, we believe that the, the lessons from history were not very well, let's say, assimilated by the negotiators of the Uruguay round. I mean, those there, because there are some voices saying, oh, but in the past we have also accepted countries which are different from the incumbents. It's true. But if you look at those countries, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Yugoslavia are small centrally planned economies. Japan is big, but not centrally planned. China is both big and centrally planned. And moreover, Hungary and so on, Hungary, definitely Hungary, Poland and Romania did not change because of the WTO. They changed because of the accession to the EU. Japan did not change because of the WTO. Japan changed when it entered the OECD and so on and so forth. Now, can they live happily ever after? And this is my last point. There have been a number of, uh, a pro of suggestions how to, how to deal with China. Three approaches stand out. Do nothing because WTO can accommodate everybody. Take justice in, the, in your own hands because WTO is useless. Or litigate intelligently because WTO can help. And we disagree with all three. This is precisely why we wrote this book. The do-nothing approach essentially means problems persist. Centrif centrifugal forces are strengthened. China crisis becomes a WTO crisis, and it is a historical as well. As I, as I was trying to explain before, there was a liberal understanding to which China does not subscribe. The take justice into your own hands approach, which is what the Trump administration adopted, uh, well, China did not flinch when unilateral tariffs were imposed. There's an excellent paper by Amity and my colleague at Columbia, David Weinstein, providing a lot of evidence to this effect. And when an agreement was signed, the phase one agreement, Chad Baum has a recent paper showing China has not delivered. Moreover, it is a classic case of managed trade. There is a great paper by Huff Bauer 
you take this case, this uh, phase one agreement to the WTO, quite frankly, I cannot predict the future, but this is one of the rare occasions, I would say, the likelihood to lose when challenging the constitution of phase one is close to zero. They used the WTO approach intelligently. Doug Nelson had organized the conference a few years ago in, uh, in New Orleans. Uh, unfortunately, he hasn't invited us back ever since. And that's where at the first time I heard this argument by Jennifer Hillman. So, well, what you can do is non-violation complaints. Fine, I mean, this you can do, but I mean, how far can you go with non-violation complaints? First, the burden of proof is quite high. Second, the burden of persuasion is extremely high, especially when we talk about uh, laws that precede, as there are many, China's accession. And it does not lead to change in the Chinese market, because even if you win with a non-violation complaint, well, China can always pay back, doesn't have to change one iota of its policies and has a lot of slack to pay back the world from. So what is our suggested approach? It's, there is a lot of discussion in the book in more detail here. I say it very semantically in the interest of time. What we say is you need new disciplines. New disciplines both to require, definitely totally new for transfer of technology, but you need to clarify also the disciplines on SOEs. The good news is there is no need to reinvent the wheel. We suggest that both the UMC, the USMACA, the Mexico, Canada, US, I'm sorry, I misspelled here, agreement and the CPTPP, they have very comprehensive chapters on both, which could be the basis for a discussion in the WTO. And uh, there is a question, of course, will China participate? To this we can discuss during the uh, Q&A session. So in our view, a new multilateral framework is the best guarantee for peaceful cohabitation. We cannot see, uh, we don't subscribe to the idea of a WTO 2.0 without China at all. Now, this is the last slide. The new DG has embarked on um, uh, some sort of, uh, uh, let's say, the blueprint of her so far, because it's too early, maybe I'm a little bit unfair here, because she's been here only for a couple of months in the WTO. But from what I've seen so far, she cares about deliverables and she wants to have some early harvesting, low hanging fruits couple of uh, brownies that will persuade the WTO members to trust the WTO again and do the bigger issues at a later stage. It's a very meritorious argument. Thanks to Doug, I read the book by uh, uh, June 9, 1971. He mentions exactly this point. And of course, Jean Monnet, that was his credence. And that was the way he saw the European integration, this functionalist approach. But eventually, the big problems will have to be addressed. Otherwise, the WTO will suffer. And in our view, China holds the key. It, I, we cannot see how you can say, I will revive the WTO as is without addressing the China issue. So to us, this is a very important negotiation. And hopefully, the kind of stuff that you see in USMACA and so on can provide the basis for negotiation in the not too distant future. And I stop here. I think I have respect for my 20 minutes and 10 seconds. That's excellent. It's a, it's a wonderful example of a Greek punctuality of which we know. Petra, I'm a Swiss, a I'm a Swiss citizen. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, you, you see the switch there. And th so thank you very much, Petros. I will not comment. Nobody will comment. Uh, only one person has the right to comment directly on what you just said, which is uh, our next speaker, Kazem from the University of Arkansas. Uh, she's a professor of political science and director of Asian studies at the university. Um, her research focuses on China's role in the global economy. So she's not here by mistake, but we very much need her expertise and in particular Chinese trade policy and Chinese behavior in global economic governance. Uh, she has authored a score of publications, but I want to uh, uh, note at least uh, Greening China, the benefits of trade and foreign direct investment, and more recently, uh, the politics of preferential trade liberalization in China and the US. She's also co-editor of several uh, um, uh, publications such as Chinese foreign trade policy, China and global trade governance. And I would like to mention the upcoming book called 
the handbook on the international political economy of China. Sorry, not the next one, the research handbook on trade wars upcoming. And we hope she will consider these forum for presenting this book, which we'll await. So the floor is yours. Take it away. You have 10 to 12 minutes, then I will cut your mic but very gently. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip, for the introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers of this event for this wonderful opportunity. It's really great to be in the company of a group of um, uh, distinguished scholars whose work I have always admired uh, to discuss this book. And so this is really important and timely book. It comes at a time of rising tensions in U.S.-China relations, as well as rising protectionism in the world economy. It's refreshing uh, to, re to read a book that argues for the need to revitalize the rules-based multilateral trading system, um, taking into consideration the developments in the global economy today. I truly appreciate the um, detailed discussions about the complaints and controversies over SOEs and forced technology transfer. Uh, I think the uh, discussions about the comparisons of China and other non-market economies in the WTO is very illuminating, in particular the differences between China and other non-market economies in terms of size, the role of the state in the economy, uh, the extent of the rule of law and geopolitics. And I also agree with the argument that uh, unilateral approaches are unlikely to be effective in dealing with the rise of China and that multilateral cooperation is very much needed uh, to induce greater Chinese concessions. So overall, I think that there, there's a lot to like about this book, uh, very timely, very important. So in the remainder of my remarks, I'd like to offer uh, several uh, questions for us to think about. Uh, these are by no means criticisms of the book, but I offer them as questions for us to think about in terms of how to improve the effectiveness of the multilateral trading system in influencing Chinese behavior. And I should also preface my remarks by saying that I'm a political uh, scientist by training, so my remarks are more likely going to focus on some of the politics behind all of this instead, instead of the legal aspect of the debate. Um, so, first of all, in terms of the context of the analysis, um, one question that I had was, um, you know, how important or how central was the China problem to the broader debate about WTO reform or the crisis in the organization? Uh, of course, we have uh, heard a lot about uh, the China challenge to the, to the World Trade Organization. Uh, there seems to be a widespread perception that China's increasingly powerful and disruptive model of state capitalism not only threatens U U.S. economic and strategic interests, but also undercuts the principal norms and, uh, and, and ideas that underpin the uh, multilateral trading system, uh, contributing to the clash between economic systems within the WTO. So it is uh, therefore undoubtedly important that we uh, develop a better understanding of the impact of China's model of state capitalism on WTO jurisprudence. However, um, while the China problem is clearly important, uh, there seems to be, uh, I guess, there, um, we, we can also take a look at some of the other deeper structural forces that may uh, have contributed to the crisis in the organization. For example, the widespread discontent generated by the deepening process of globalization and structural shifts of the global economy. So um, maybe a little bit more discussion of how to talk of the China problem uh, fits within the broader discussion of WTO reform would help to uh, illuminate all the context of the analysis. And along similar lines, I think that uh, the, policy, the, the, the questions, the, 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 the priority issues of SOEs and technology transfers are obviously important, but it seems that the WTO membership is also faced with a number of other challenges in, uh, in other areas that would seem to require not just the bilateral, but also multilateral uh, cooperation. Uh, for example, industrial subsidies is already an issue facing WTO members uh, prior to the pandemic. 
um, the COVID-19 crisis uh, has further accentuated the need uh, for member countries to negotiate multilateral discipline to address the spillover effects that subsidies may have on international uh, competition. Right now, everybody is subsidizing every industry. Um, um, many national governments are bailing out uh, the domestic industries. Uh, so how can the uh, international community, WTO member countries, get together uh, to address these, to tackle these pressing issues? Uh, some of these deep discussions were already underway uh, prior to the pandemic, but they got delayed or being shelved uh, as as a result of the attention that has been devoted to uh, to the to the crisis. So, as some scholars have argued, uh, subsidies is not simply a China issue, and instead require broader international cooperation. So, uh, and in addition to these issues, WTO members also face the need to negotiate new or to update existing uh, rules in areas such as e-commerce, uh, digital trade, and uh, and and many other issue areas. Uh, so, I guess um, maybe a you know, little bit more discussion of the context and the centrality of China. Uh, in the crisis faced by the WTO uh, would help to better you know, set the stage of the discussion. Um, my second point has to do with the focus on priority issues of SOEs and forced technology transfer. Uh, these are clearly important issue areas as they, they relate directly uh, to China's model of state capitalism. Um, my question as I was reading, as I was reading this uh, was that, um, I was wondering to what extent uh, the argument about the need to negotiate new rules would also apply to some other issues of concern vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Uh, the international, besides the issues of SOEs and forced technology transfer, um, the international community also has a lot of legitimate concerns uh, with China uh, in the areas of intellectual property rights, um, market access, and others. So, um, uh, with do you expect uh, the, with the, art, the argument developed in this book can be generalized to these other issue areas as well? Are new rules needed in those areas too, or are existing um, existing uh, rules sufficient uh, to deal with those issues? Or is it a matter of the insufficient utilization of existing rules? Uh, this, you know, um, some discussions of this issue uh, would also be uh, helpful. Uh, so the next couple of points really relate to the politics of the negotiation and enforcement of new rules. Uh, I, I guess that most readers will likely agree with the argument that multilateralism uh, still matters in an age of rising protectionism and unilateralism in the world economy. Um, if these rules cannot be negotiated or effectively implemented or enforced, we'll be back to ground zero. And the book does give due consideration to these issues, uh, for example, proposing the negotiation of plurilateral, if not multilateral agreements among WTO members as a potentially viable approach uh, forward. And I agree that there are we must certainly merits to the plurilateral approach to negotiations. Um, but as you acknowledge in the book, whether the Chinese leadership would be willing to sit down at the negotiation table and um, and to co co cooperate with other WTO members in such negotiations remains highly uncertain, uh, especially given that issues related to SOEs and technology transfer uh, lie at the heart of China's core interests in protecting its domestically powerful industries. The fact that some of the recent plurilateral and even multilateral and even plurilateral negotiations on issue areas such as fisheries and e-commerce have not always proceeded in the de uh, desired direction um, may speak to some of the challenges that such negotiations may face uh, with China as a central player at the negotiation table. So, how do we build consensus in Geneva? How do we get the countries to come around uh, to agree to the negotiation of such rules uh, is a question that I think um, uh, merits further uh, investigation. And um, related to that, of course, was the uh, implementation and enforcement of existing rules. Uh, as Professor Navroides mentioned in his remarks, China does have a relatively good record in implementing adverse rulings. Um, but I'm still a bit concerned about the possibility 
of creative interpretation that the creative policy makers would come up with ways to cut around corners and engage in interpretation and implementation of the rules in such a way that the policy may not directly uh, contradict the principles of the, w, uh, the, 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 the legal rules of the WTO, but would nevertheless undercut the spirit of the liberal understanding uh, behind the organization. And uh, of course, this is a uh, this is an issue that the um, the call for the proposal for uh, stronger, you know, um, more enforceable contractual legal language is precisely designed to address. Um, but I remain a little bit concerned about the possibility that um, uh, even though the language might be fairly explicit, it may, may be very uh, fairly clear. I may not be able to capture the full range of uh, behavior that um, the rules are designed to go after. So, how do we write rules that are on the one hand explicit and clear enough in their purposes, but then uh, encompassing enough and flexible enough on the other hand uh, would seem to be a delicate balance to strike. And then relatedly, of course, uh, there is the tradition in China that the negotiation of a formal contract is only the beginning of the negotiations. And this is a problem that is further exacerbated by the weak rule of law and court system in China, uh, despite recent efforts to reform the system. Uh, so um, uh, effective implementation and how to make this work on the ground, I think, uh, would be challenges, uh, some of the potential challenges ahead. And in all of this, I think domestic politics play a very important role. Every time we talk about um, the reform of WTO rules or uh, you know, reform a particular aspect of the organization, you're likely to run into a certain uh, protracted, very you know, entrenched and powerful domestic interests. And um, so, uh, and judging from its behavior in the past, uh, China seems to have adopted a somewhat, somewhat of a pragmatic or utilitarian approach to WTO negotiations, uh, cooperating where it's, uh, uh, the issue of lines with Beijing's domestic interests, but backtracking on other issues otherwise. So it is important that the international community pays close attention to the domestic political economy dynamics in China and identify areas where there may already exist some pressure or uh, impetus for reform. And then lastly, I'll just, by I'll just conclude by saying that um, efforts to revitalize the rules-based multilateral trading system are also taking place at a time of rising protectionism, unilateralism, and regionalism in the global economy that are threatening to make the WTO system less and less relevant. Uh, so how do we, uh, whether we have the sufficient political will in the, in, in the major capitals to push through uh, the difficult negotiations uh, remains the question ahead. Uh, while the Biden administration has expressed a strong willingness to work with other WTO members to push for meaningful reform of the organization, uh, so far its specific positions and goals have remained somewhat vague. And while the United uh, the European Union has demonstrated a willingness to work with the United States to tackle the China challenge, it nevertheless disagrees with the United States about uh, whether, uh, for example, whether to include China in the negotiations from the outset. And other emerging economies such as India and South Korea uh, seems to be of the view that plurilateral agreements are inconsistent with WTO rules and will not necessarily be effective in addressing the issue. And so I, I guess, you know, the prospect of negotiation of new WTO rules, I would therefore have to be viewed in light of the configuration of uh, political forces at both the domestic and international level. Uh, 30 more seconds. So overall, I feel that the international trading community has much to gain from modern fundamental reforms of the WTO system and, the, and from China's willing participation in this process. And the transition from the Trump to the Biden administration uh, presents a potential opportunity to build momentum for such a process. And China has an important role to play in this in, in, in this regard. It's a centerpiece of these of these reforms, uh, both as an object and as an active participant. So I'll just leave it there. Um, and thank you. And um, it's us oh, thanking you. Excellent. Um, we have a tiny uh, glitch with the video, sometimes it disappear into the background. This is just to clarify that I had no role in that. Okay, I'm not that ruthless of a, of a chair. But this was very clear and very interesting. And I think also a very nice uh, segue into 
our next uh, reaction and presentation by uh, Luca Rubini. Luca Rubini is a reader in international economic law at the University of Birmingham. He has a special interest in the regulation of state intervention in the economy and as an Oxford University Press monograph on the definition of subsidy, uh, state aids, that uh, I, I, I am being told uh, has been translated into Chinese, I presume by Luca himself. Uh, is working on various projects on the regulation of subsidies and um, state-owned enterprises. And uh, um, now uh, you will all understand that the regulation of subsidies perhaps is the most contentious issue in the apparently intractable dilemma of how to make China and the WTO like each other. Um, therefore, we are very delighted to have Luca with us. And uh, we know that subsidies is Luca's middle name. Luca, we are all ears. Wonderful presentation slides. So the floor is yours. I, I, I just I invite everybody to um, to pick the mute button while Luca is speaking, so we can immerse in this experience with him. Okay, thank you very much to the organizer. Uh, it's it's really I'm very glad. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and to provide my few very humble comments to uh, uh, Tani, a, a part of, of Petra's book. Uh, I wanted to be entertaining and a little bit provo provocative, so I apologize for that already. Uh, probably the title of my presentation should not be Why Going With The Yankees, by, but uh, rather Why Going Only With The Yankees, as you will see uh, in, in, in... Okay. Um, um, the book uh, that we have is a very comprehensive analysis uh, of the uh, 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 issue that we are uh, dealing with. Uh, uh, it is a must read, uh, so this is really addressed uh, to the audience. And my comments only focus on a specific bit comes in, coming out of it to the SOE's disciplines proposals, and in particular to what I can find in uh, these three pages. So clearly, probably this does not do justice to uh, uh, every possible idea that Vetro had in mind. Um, I have the feeling uh, that uh, uh, what uh, uh, Petros and Andrea are saying is that we, we like the CPTPP or TPP 2.0 and US uh, MCA or NAFTA 2.0 uh, model very much, uh, and I could I would tag it as the American model. Uh, I would ask uh, why is that? Uh, I can really understand because it is a very comprehensive discipline. It is a very recent discipline. Uh, the TPP, as uh, Petros uh, explained, was clearly spearheaded and drafted by Obama, and in particular. Uh, the chapter on SOEs having China in mind, but are these sufficient reasons to guarantee uh, a kind of objective superiority uh, to this model? Or to put it another way, don't we have also other alternative models? And here I would say a, a possible European model after 23, uh, 23 years in the UK, I have really become a, a European. Uh, alternative models that could become uh, perhaps complementary. So I'm not necessarily putting the two into a very strong opposition, but uh, only uh, as complementary models. So perhaps what we could have, that's uh, my message, is a mixed transplant uh, that could address all the issues in a, a balanced uh, way. I'm asking whether this is also the spirit of the trilateral, but probably uh, from what I will comment uh, in a few minutes, uh, this is not the case. Or maybe, maybe the reason why uh, 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 Petros and Andres said we like the CPTPP or the American model is mainly due to practical considerations. And this is news that came out two weeks uh, ago only. Uh, clearly, before uh, the ideation, the the the, 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 uh, the creation of the book and its publication, but it looks like that behind the scenes, China is really 
uh, entering into negotiations to enter into the uh, uh, TPP. Uh, so if that happens, clearly uh, everybody would uh, be uh, very happy. Uh, I would be very happy. We would have won our cap and we would have no particular problem uh, to address uh, anymore. But starting to talk a little bit more seriously, what is this American model about? Uh, we are referring, uh, Petros and Andrea are referring to two chapters of the two PTAs I have uh, mentioned, what definition of SOE, which has been quite uh, an infamous uh, issue uh, and uh, it has generated infamous findings by uh, the WTO dispute settlement body, particularly the upper body, here is based on control. Um, you have a dissociation of the obligations to act in accordance with commercial consideration from the prohibition of discrimination, which is clearly welcome, as Petros have suggested, because this is overhauling uh, a case law of the GATT that uh, made a complete mess and narrowed the uh, potential uh, uh, scope of Article uh, 17 of the GATT. There is a very elaborate discipline of non-commercial assistance, assistance, and you can read support or subsidies to SOEs, and equally a very elaborate uh, uh, regime on transparency. That's really, in a nutshell, it's quite thick. I hope I have made a little bit of justice to uh, the American uh, model. Now, a little bit of, I would say, very much preliminary analysis, because I, I have not really, uh, uh, during this year, devoted much time to this topic. It is mostly because of this presentation that I wanted to start thinking hard. My impressions are that at times, this American model is a little bit too complex. Uh, you simply have to see the disciplines on commercial assistance. Uh, it takes even a trade expert, maybe I'm not, uh, to read it uh, several times to grasp the nuances uh, that are uh, there and the different, different uh, sets of facts to which the uh, various provisions would apply. The style itself is very verbose, uh, elaborate, and, it, and, and we know as lawyers that this is not necessarily a guarantee of exhaustiveness or a guarantee against the judicial creativity. Um, now, second point, and I think this was raised by uh, uh, Kainer previous uh, 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 speech. Uh, why SOEs only and not uh, proposing uh, 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 a regulation of subsidies more generally? The two issues are closely interconnected and clearly dealing with both of them together would ensure uh, many opportunities for trade-offs and for uh, a balance. Uh, even the uh, American model, when it, it regulates non-commercial assistance to uh, SOE as well, uh, it looks like that they have uh, somewhat uh, uh, forgotten uh, the other big complaint concerning subsidies of SOEs, which is subsidies granted by SOEs. Or maybe I read the uh, TPP uh, uh, a little bit too quickly. Uh, final point, there is a lack of very clear recognitions that sometimes balance each other. For example, of ownership neutrality, well, to be fair, you have it, a very short one, but also of level playing field or competitive neutrality, two sides of the same coin. Let me rephrase it. One thing is to say members are free to regulate their economy as they wish, property uh, neutrality, ownership neutrality. Quite another thing is to say all enterprises, be they public or private, are equal under the law, are subject under the law. Uh, these are two sides of the same coin, and in my view, they should really go hand in hand. These are important post holders to ensure a legal and political balance to convey a message which may be, uh, I'm reading things too much simplistically, but could provide an obstacle if you want to negotiate with China. If you start saying SOEs are special and you need a special regulation, probably the negotiations are finished. 
So the idea to convey is that SOEs are not special. They are like other enterprises. What we need, though, are adjustments to eliminate the advantages that may derive from their close government connection and thus ensure that competition really operates fairly. It is mostly a diplomatic point, uh, but I think it may uh, have some practical importance. Now, what about the other model? Uh, this is the EU Vietnam agreement, which to be fair is also mentioned by uh, Petros. You have a comprehensive discipline of both subsidies and SOEs. Again, a definition which is based on various criteria of control, uh, definitions of commercial activities and commercial considerations, both sides of the coin, ownership neutrality, competitive neutrality. Interestingly, uh, here, uh, Vietnam was probably a demandeur, and they managed to insert into the agreements commitments on commercial considerations and non-discrimination similar to the CPTPP, but simpler in their drafting. You have a requirement to observe internationally recognized standards of corporate governance and quite elaborate transparency provisions. Now, if you look at another agreement, probably it's less interesting because we are not dealing with a centralized market economy, Vietnam, but a highly uh, competitive and market economy like Singapore, but it's more of the same. If possible, you have an upgrade because all these disciplines are inserted into the competition law and policy uh, uh, chapter. But the same type of balance, given uh, uh, granted all the differences of these EU PTAs come out. So where all these come from? If not, strictly speaking, this is the Brussels effect uh, put forward by uh, uh, Professor Bradford, a colleague of, of uh, Petros at Columbia Law School. EU PTAs are a clear examples of the EU shaping trade laws on the basis of its internal laws. Uh, there are key principles of the EU stated model and at times even more uh, than those. Uh, you see, we have to look at the negotiating guidelines, for example, uh, with Australia or New Zealand. The European Commission has the specific uh, uh, directions to follow uh, the uh, internal EU state aid and state intervention uh, and model. And in the end, this is it. Um, we have a system which clearly cannot be taken as a single package and exported, transplant, transplanted uh, to uh, the international level. Uh, we recent, I recently had the pleasure to uh, examine a, an excellent PhD uh, at the UI by Chloe Papazian, who made this point very uh, forcefully, and, and I take it. But I think that it's not only about an American model, uh, but it's also about taking the best that you have out there in the international practice of PTAs, including EU uh, PTAs. So I would not exclude anything from the table, at least at this initial level of discussion before diplomacy kicks in. And although there is, uh, to be frank, a great deal of overlap between all these various models, so there is a very great, a great deal of overlap, there are differences in substance, in emphasis, in balance, and also nuances. Um, so I think that here, good old comparative law uh, may become uh, useful, and I've taken the liberty before closing to, to really cite uh, this very nice quote from the instructions to the American servicemen in Britain in the 40s. The British don't know how to make a good cup of tea, you don't know how to make a good cup of a good cup of coffee. Sorry, you don't know how to make a good cup of tea. It's an even as well. So uh, that is my main comment. So don't stop only and mimic uh, the TPP or the USMCA. Uh, there are odd facts though, stones on the road. So what are the US, the UN, China, and others doing elsewhere? Look at the leaks, the uh, lax leaks or the TTIP negotiations. Well, the US was reluctant 
to negotiate discipline for all subsidies. They wanted to focus on SOEs only and only SOEs at the federal level. The EU was exactly the reverse. Uh, you can have very strong discipline of SOEs, but before that, more generally, we need to have disciplines and subsidies, and we need to have similar uh, uh, disciplines for uh, private and public uh, undertakings, and certainly also at the subfederal level. Trilateral, well, at the very beginning uh, on the agenda, you had new rules for SOEs. Not a single result, a single IOTA text came out on SOEs in four years. Apparently, from rumors that I heard, it is the EU here that objects to it because of the principle of ownership neutrality in the Treaty of Rome. And what about the current agreements with China, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and the, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment? No references to SOEs. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, so very good points, but probably I would suggest to have a broader reach in terms of proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. Wonderful, interesting. And for everybody in the audience and for everybody who will watch this on YouTube, the comments on American and uh, British people are about 70 years old, so nobody gets offended about uh, skills in mixing tea and coffee. Uh, next up, and I would like everybody to just take their breath and renew their attention, comes uh, uh, Julia Chin from Wayne State University. She is professor at Wayne State University Law School in the US. Uh, she uh, read law at Peking University and postgraduate okay. studies, uh, including an SJD degree from Harvard Law School, which I'm told is a reputable institution. Uh, a scholarship focuses on WTO law, especially China-related issues, so we're obviously elated that she agreed to join us today. Uh, one of her recent articles, Post Technology Transfer and the US-China Trade War Implication for International Economic Law, is published in 2019 in the journal International Economic Law, and I'd like to cite another one recent called WTO reform, multilateral control over unilateral retaliation lessons from the US-China trade war, which you will understand is pretty much bang on point for the discussion today. So we're exceptionally happy to have you with us, Julia, today, and we are eager to listen to you and learn lots. The floor is yours for 10 to 15 minutes. Everybody else, please mute, and we are eager to listen. Thank you, Philippo, for that very kind introduction. Also, I'd like to thank Giuseppe for inviting me for this exciting event. Uh, but above all, I'd like to thank Petros and his co-author for writing this timely and significant book. China and WTO law is a subject that motivated most of my own research. In fact, my first piece on the subject, WTO Plus Obligations of China, which was published 2003 in the Journal of World Trade, benefited from a very concise but important comment from Petros when he was the editor at the journal reviewing the piece. Uh, many years later, I was invited to his seminar at Columbia University devoted to the topic of a China SOE and the WTO law. So I see this book as a fruit of years of the author's careful research and effort. Uh, so the book contains the high wisdom of ultimate insider of the world trading system. So I'm very honored to have this opportunity to discuss the book. First of all, I wish to say that uh, I agree with the book's basic observation. There is a gap between the Chinese system and the WTO regime. Due to this gap, China may not have violated letter of WTO rules, but still violated spirit of the WTO. Secondly, I wholeheartedly agree a multilateral solution is superior to unilateral or bilateral solutions, and updating the WTO rulebook is absolutely necessary. That said, I do have some reservations about the particular suggestions made by the book. I will discuss first false technology transfer issue and then comment on some SOE issues. If time permits, I will comment on what I think is the most critical challenge China poses to the world trading system. 
On technology transfer, I have two general observations. First, contrary to the book suggestion, unilateral and bilateral measures have worked quite effectively on this issue in practice. Here are the basic facts. Forced technology transfer emerged as a major issue when the U.S. released Section 301 report in March 2018 on China. Based on the findings in that report, the U.S. imposed Section 301 tariffs on Chinese products, which started the U.S.-China trade war. Although the Chinese government has never admitted the existence of forced technology transfer in the country, it quickly, very quickly, adopted new foreign investment law in March 2019, which explicitly outlawed practice of foreign forced technology transfer by government officials and agencies. In addition, very importantly, China has been phasing out mandatory joint venture requirements, which, as Petros uh, noted, makes forced technology transfer more difficult to detect. Currently, there is only 10 areas remain subject to mandatory JV requirements. Of the 10 areas, one is in the agricultural sector, two in manufacturing, seven in services. One of the two in manufacturing is making of automobiles. That restriction, however, will be phased out next year, according to law. In addition to domestic law changes, China has undertaken treaty obligations to eliminate forced technology transfer. The most comprehensive of such undertaking is made under the U.S.-China Phase 1 agreement, which contains a whole chapter on technology transfer. Legally, China's undertaking under the Phase 1 can be multilateralized through the MFN clauses in treaties to which China is a party. For example, if China requires a foreign company to transfer technology as a condition for selling equipment to China, which did happen in the past, China now will have violated GAT MFN for failing to extend the benefit of the phase one to that country. So in so far as investment access is in concern. However, multilateralization cannot be realized through the WTO because the WTO does not have a comprehensive agreement on investment. But China is also party to more than 100 bilateral investment treaties uh, and more than 20 free trade agreements with the investment chapters. These bids and the FTAs all contain MFN clauses. The largest FTA China has ever joined is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, which Luca mentioned. RCEP has 15 members, ASEAN 10 plus Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, and China. And seven of the 15 are also CPTPP members. It was adopted in November 2020. It's expected to enter into force early next, China, uh, early next year. China already notified RCEP. In addition to MFN, importantly, RCEP has its own provision on technology transfer. That provision contains similar language to that in CPTPP. That is, a party may not impose or enforce as a condition for investment in another party technology transfer. Similar provision also included in the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, CAI, which was reached early this year, but its, its approval has been shelved for political reasons. So between phase one, RCEP and CAI, the complaints by the US, Japan, and the EU about CPT, uh, forced technology transfer in China have been addressed at least at the level of international rulemaking. My second observation is this, it may not be appropriate for the WTO to formulate its own technology transfer rule based on the CPTPP model. And here's why. Forced technology transfer is essentially a government policy that demands technology transfer in exchange for market access. In reality, only countries with large enough domestic markets can make such a demand. But isn't a large domestic market part of a comparative advantage? What's wrong with the policy? of market for technology. From an economics perspective, the policy is objectionable because it endorses government monopsony. Normatively, however, the question of whether market for technology is an unfair policy cannot be answered in absolute terms. 
when a country with a low level, relatively low level technology development, asks a foreign investor to transfer technology in exchange for market access, like what China did in the early days of its economic development, the foreign investors typically do not really care that much. In principle, the WTO encourages technology transfer, especially from developed countries into de uh, developing countries. Therefore, for the WTO to enact new rules on technology transfer, it may need to take into account the relative level of economic and technological development of the countries in question. Now, next uh, SOEs, I'd just like to briefly comment on three aspects. First, the general discipline on SOE behavior. Second, the SOES public body and their SEM agreement. Third, special remedy provisions against Chinese subsidies under the WTO. My overall observation is this. Existing WTO rules are quite capable of regulating the Chinese state sector, except perhaps with respect to transnational subsidies, uh, which Petrol's mentioned. So, first of all, uh, as the author, authors also noted in the book, uh, China's WTO accession protocol contains a whole slew of China specific rules, including a number of provisions on SOEs. These provisions not only require Chinese SOEs to conduct businesses solely based on commercial considerations, but also requires the Chinese government not to interfere with the operation of SOEs. These requirements impose, in my view, a stricter discipline on SOEs than CPTPP or any other models, I mean, the EU Vietnamese agreement. Uh, so the problem is not really the lack of WTO rules on Chinese SOEs, for, but the lack of uh, enforcement of existing rules, which is entirely a different topic. Now, second, on um, public body issue, uh, we understand that the, the uh, recall that the public body uh, has refused to define public body by government control. According to the, uh, a public body, whether an entity is a public body should depend on whether it's vested with authority to exercise governmental function. But what constitutes governmental function is a particular, uh, is a question that has to be decided on a country by country basis. But the AB did reject the notion that a public body must have the power to regulate. So this imprecise and kind of fluid definition provides certain flexibility in interpretation. Importantly, since the AB articulated its public body jurisprudence around 20, 2014, there has been significant legal development in China. In the past few years, the government has required all SOEs to specify in their articles association the legal status and the leadership role of the Communist Party organization in their corporate governance. In 2018, China amended Article 1 of its constitution to add a new provision stating the Communist Party's leadership is the most essential feature of socialism with Chinese characteristics. With these legal developments, it, in my view, it would be much easier for WTO judges to characterize all Chinese SOEs as public bodies under its current standards. Lastly, regardless of whether the SOE can be defined as public body, the China Accession Protocol contains a powerful provision that allows all other WTO members to treat China as a non-market economy in their action against Chinese subsidies. Under this provision, a member may use external prices, that is foreign market prices or world market prices, as the benchmark to determine whether Chinese products have received benefits from government subsidies. This provision applies to all Chinese subsidies, regardless of whether the subsidy is provided by government or through the SOEs. Very significantly, this provision has no expiration date. Unlike the non-market economy clause for anti-dumping action in China accession protocol, which expired 2016, it is always a mystery to me why this highly powerful provision has never been utilized in practice by any member. Do I still have a couple of minutes? Two, okay, all right. So on the whole, I don't think the most critical challenge China poses to the world trading system arises from its unique economic system. For sure, China's economic system presents real challenges, but it seems to me most of these challenges can be dealt with by the existing system, 
whether through multilateral or bilateral arrangements or even multi uh, or even unilateral measures. In my opinion, the most difficult and critical challenge posed by China stems from its competing model of governance. The connection here to trade is China's strict control over cross-border flows of information and data. China's great firewall and its draconian regulation of data flow likely have already violated existing W2 rules and the GATS in particular, but no member has ever seriously challenged China on these grounds. More problematically, China is exporting its model of governance to other countries. Its illiberal model of information data governance threatens the future of the liberal trading system and WTO is at the core of which. The world really needs new international rules to deal with this critical challenge and it's in this context that I see WTO multilateralism matter the most. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Extremely interesting. And um, I'm very happy that the last three speakers uh, delved into the details of the discipline and the various solutions and problems and dilemmas, because I believe but we will uh, figure out all together that the next two speakers instead might take a step back and give a general assessment of the situation. Before I introduce uh, the penultimate speaker, I would just remind everybody that we have put a voucher to buy this book in the chat and the code is MAV21, which I believe is uh, what you also read on Petrus's license plate. Um, so the next speaker uh, today with us is Douglas, and I would like to check whether Douglas can hear us and uh, uh, we can hear him. Could you say something so we can? I will introduce him first and Wiley unmute so, himself. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear very well. Thank you very much, Doug. Happy that you're with us in uh, in flesh and, and and sound. So Douglas from Tulane University is a professor of economics at the Murphy Institute and Department of Economics uh, at the university. His research primarily focuses on the economics, politics and law of international trade and international migration. Please note that he is an economist through and through and presumably has a certain indifference uh, to loyally nonsense that would benefit very much many in the audience and me for sure. So I'm very glad and grateful that you're with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I should point out that although I am an economist through and through, I have never taken an economics course. I have a PhD in political science and fell among economists first, Mike Finger and others, and then fell among lawyers more recently. So. Um, if Land. this confession, if this confession lands in hot waters uh, uh, institutionally, we can edit this from the video afterwards. No, I believe everybody is clear that I don't know much about anything. So, luckily, I hang around with people that know a lot about it, and I will speak at a general level because I don't know details. I lack the lawyer's uh, ability to to see things. I also I made slides. I don't know how to do it on my iPad, so I'm going to read my slides from my computer, and you'll. All it is is words anyway. Um, so let me start with a brief encomium. This is a great book, right book, right time, written by Dream Team, the Dean of European Policy Economist, for my money, the great scholar of WTO law, packed with wisdom and useful and usable information. If you're interested in trade law in the WTO and or current politics of Chinese trade relations, you should read it carefully. Okay, so what I wanted to do uh, again, relatively briefly, is first discuss this whole idea of a liberal understanding that sits at the heart of Mavroides and Sapir's analysis. Second, ask whether or not the WTO really is the obvious place to deal with forced technology transfer and state-owned enterprises. And for me, because I lack lawyers' focus, for me, state-owned enterprises is an issue of subsidies. And I, I understand what Luca is saying, but for me, a, a rube with respect to all of this stuff it just is a case where, you know, uh, subsidies uh, matter. Okay. And then I want to ask how we square positive engagement with China as a WTO member in good standing uh, and a power in trade with the highly problematic domestic and international politics 
away from trade, which I think is is a real issue for the going forward. All right, first on the liberal understanding. Um, a linchpin of the analysis in the book is the existence of this liberal understanding that can both frame new rules for the WTO with general application and create expectations for what would constitute good behavior on the part of China. Unfortunately, I have pretty serious doubts about that liberal understanding from both a positive and normative perspective. Positive problems. First, on origins, the authors lean pretty hard on the ITO negotiations as informative about this understanding. But it's important to remember the ITO failed at the time as a constitutional event. It was a failure. It wasn't ratified. In addition, I really struggle to understand the significance of an event that occurred at a moment in history so far removed from our own. From our own. The U.S. was a genuinely hegemonic power with developed over a considerable period of time, soft power, what Joe and I called soft power that Trump has utterly destroyed. The US will never get it back. The whole point of soft power is that people expect you to behave a certain way. Once you stop, that's it. You don't get it back. Trade was a relatively small part of most economies then. Trade was the sort associated with what Richard Baldwin calls the first unbundling. That is no uh, global value chains, et cetera. All of those were more important than any shared, shared liberal understanding at the time. Even at the time, it wasn't clear that there was much agreement on a liberal understanding. So how do we see this, for example, related to Greggie's embedded liberalism? Remember that Schumpeter and many American politicians at the time simply called that socialism. When Schumpeter used the term so socialism, he meant Keynesianism in a welfare state. There was a big disagreement on the liberal understanding. Um, so how deep is that understanding now think about a variety of things think about labor markets in the us and denmark think about corporate governance in the us and germany think about healthcare in the us and the uk think about competition policy in the us and the eu and and thomas philippon's recent work makes it clear that those things are really really different and then environmental policy in the us and other places all of those have significant trade spillovers these are pretty fundamental differences in national political economies rooted in very broad differences in public attitudes about state society relations. All of them involve much more active and significant state role in Europe and the U US. But even in the US state sector, in the US, the state sector is pretty big in healthcare, education, environmental policy, regional and poverty policy. So suppose we believe as some scholars seem to find that international competition undermines unions, welfare states, Keynesian policies, why would it not be reasonable for Europe to erect barriers to US imports based on unfair competition claims? More currently, if Europe adopts a strong form of border measures to deal with environmental policy, which is certainly possible, why would we not expect those policies to be aimed at the US? So if there's a liberal understanding among such different countries, how do we draw lines with respect to the Chinese economy? But to me, it, the, the whole liberal understanding thing seems pretty complicated. How should we evaluate the performance claims that underwrite the liberal understanding? So presumably, the idea is that capitalist markets of some kind and democratic politics of some kind deliver the best outcomes defined somehow, but presumably non-trivially. But Chinese policy is dr delivering dramatically good outcomes on most measures. That's after all why we care, right? If China were bumbling around, the fact that it's got a billion people wouldn't bother us at all. The usual claim is that China cheats, but if the economic under analysis that undergirds the normative claims of, about capitalism are correct, and I think they are, then SOE should produce worse performance, not better. And I've seen no evidence that the current levels and kinds of forced technology transfer are anywhere large enough to offset those kind of losses and produce sufficient gains in performance to account for decades of high growth. So if the explanation is that China's version of capitalism works qua capitalism, just as European and US versions work, even though they're very different, then what's the problem exactly? And how do we draw the line between them? Now, others have raised the issues about, and I'll leave that there and move on to multilateral rulemaking. Others have raised the issue of what changes in WTO rules would be needed. My concern is slightly different. 
The trading system needs to move forward on rules that will help protect the system against conflict on issues like SOEs or subsidies more general and forced technology transfer. But the WTO is stuck. Trump was only a relatively small, if very visible, part of the problem. The Doha round had failed long before Trump. India was a much bigger problem for the liberal consensus than Trump and China. So, you know, I, you know, how do we see the WTO as the linchpin of anything that's big? Now, Bernard Hookman and I, like everyone else around this very distributed globally table, have suggested steps toward a regime capable of moving forward in a relatively liberal way. But I can't see a world in which this happens in the WTO. That doesn't mean the WTO doesn't have a lot of good work to do, continuing attempts to move forward on the core agenda of, of um, liberalization, reestablishing effective dispute resolution on border measures, promotion of transparency uh, on border measures. But I can't see how it can move forward on fundamentally rewriting the rules. There is no support for a genuinely constitutional moment, even in a functionalist way, whether, you know, Ernie Hap Haas and, and Joe Nye were writing it. And, and, and of course, um, the, the Carl Deutsch, the, the great um, genius of all of them, had this idea that Europe could move forward like that. But, you know, there was this matter of two world wars that kind of focused attention. Um, there's no support for that for that right now. And it's not clear that issues like forced technology transfer and subsidies are best handled with a black letter law approach anyway, that writing it into the WTO would improve things. So to my mind, this means serious work on core issues, subsidies, competition policies, forced technology transfer among the core trading nations, US, EU, China, others committed to broadly liberal trade relations, Canada, Australia, Japan, others, one thing this should definitely not be about is an attempt to respond to, to the threat of China. And that I think we're kind of all agreed on and that's not a point of disagreement. So let me just sort of finish with this idea about the threat of China. Everything I've said to this point derives from my belief that China benefits from broadly liberal trading relations. And in a sense is not really a problem the, the problem is a collective one. I mean, the US and Europe have been fighting over Airbus and, and Boeing for ages. You know, we, you know, the business of how subsidies work, where they work matters everywhere. Unfortunately, China is very much a potential problem from a geopolitical perspective. This flows to a large extent from a very fraught history with the West on geopolitical issues that Chinese citizens are very aware of and the lack of any kind of de democratic pressure release in the face of domestic discontent. That is, China relies almost exclusively on what political scientists call output legitimacy. As long as performance is good, people are happy. But with no input legitimacy, if things go wrong, and they will, they always do, the Chinese Communist Party will turn to international adventurism. South China Sea, Indian border, Russian border, protection of quote, regional interests. How are we supposed to move forward on integration of our common economic interests while we worry about containing that political threat? That's a problem that neither Dean Acheson nor G George Kennan had to deal with. It was just containment. There was no issue of working about working out cooperation with a major economic competitor. Let me finish where the author's book ends. They say, for all the reasons mentioned in this volume, the game should be played in Geneva at the WTO headquarters. The WTO is at the forefront of genuinely multilateral cooperation. Transition, if it has to occur, should be managed within its confines. Ideally, we should even drop the term transition and return to the mundane but quite necessary idea of enduring cooperation. I wish that were true, but it sounds like wishful thinking to me. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Doug. We all have wishful thinking uh, uh, now and then. So you'll be, you'll be just one of us in, uh, in, in hoping wishfully. And uh, that brings us, I believe, uh, very appropriately to Bernard, with whom I invite to get very much ready. Um, Bernard Oekman is professor and director, global economics at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies, the European University Institute 
in Fiesole, not far away from uh, Santana. He previously worked at the World Bank and the GATT Secretariat, so you, you know he's the real deal. He is a CEPR Research Fellow and member of the World Economic Forum Global Action Council on Logistics and Supply Chain, something I mentioned because he is a world leading expert on supply chains, which of course came very handy recently to analyze how international trade arrangements facilitate or hinder the global response to COVID-19. Recently, uh, he authored with Petros an editorial called, and I quote, WTO reform back to the past to build for the future, unquote. A hopeful critique of how the WTO could overcome contemporary challenges. That brings us back to Petros, of course, and also to the challenges lying ahead for the WTO. Bernard, where are we at with those challenges and what can be done? Okay, thanks. I'll try and keep this um, short. We're focusing here on the book. Of course, Petros and I and Doug and many on the call have done lots of work on many of these issues. So um, I think any criticism, criticism of the book should be balanced by the fact that there's lots of positive stuff going on, which is not in the book. So let me, let me start with a slide that Petros kind of briefly mentioned and that I think is actually underemphasized uh, in the book. And basically the bottom line here is that China has performed like gangbusters, right? As the Americans would say. I mean, the growth and the sustained high level of economic growth in China has been absolutely phenomenal. We've never seen this before in history. And they just did a lot of things right. Right. And right now they're eating our lunch. So I think part of the context for this, uh, I think we really need to take this seriously because in a sense, we're responding to a model we might not like in terms of the politics, but in terms of the economics, no matter how inefficient some of us might argue, some of these things have been, I mean, they have delivered. So in terms of Doug's output legitimacy, it's there big time. And I think one of the big kind of implications of that has been, okay, fine, we are all whining about China and, you know, saying, oh, it's all unfair. My God, they actually took us up. They actually followed our advice. They actually did their homework, right? So now we have to bear the consequences and we wish to God we had never opened Pandora's box. Okay, fine, but we are where we are. But I think that context is important because one of the implications we're seeing right now is of course that we are going down that path as well, right? And we're saying, oh, maybe we should be doing some of these things ourselves. <laughs> the bottom line though is given how fast China has grown, given the size of the Chinese market today, there's no firm in Europe that doesn't want to sell to China, right? It is a really big part of the world economy. So therefore we need to figure out a way to keep it part of the world economy or else they will go off and they will do their own thing. The same way that the European Union seems to be wanting to do the same thing on digital and data, right? Which at the end of the day, if you think about it, is not that far away actually from where we are in China, except very different objectives. So I also wanna stress the point, which again is part of the context and which is a bit, I think, unfortunate in the book because it is so narrowly focused, not just on China and the WTO, but on SOEs and technology transfer is that there is a hell of a lot more out there that also affects China. Digital, climate change and trade, uh, investments, just think about the comprehensive agreement on investment that was negotiated, which clearly is there for uh, a signal that China thinks this is also something worth doing. Competition policy, how do we deal with platform, uh, these platform uh, firms, the Amazons and the Googles of the world, taxation, digital services, taxes, all of this stuff is out there. All of this stuff is really big. And I would argue all of that stuff is actually much bigger than what we're talking about with just China because it affects many countries, but also China. And I think I mentioned this because China has an interest in all of this. And I think the only way forward in terms of the bottom line message of the book is we have to negotiate this stuff with China is we're gonna to have to bring things to the table where the Chinese authorities say, this is actually something we care about. This is gonna help us. 
And a bit of the problem I find with the China centric, the Chinese, the, the obsession with China, it's all about what should China do to make us happier? And essentially a lot of what we're talking about with the make us happier is fiddling around the margins and closing the barn door when the horse has already bolted, right? So we're not really looking forward. And I think this is a big problem for the system. And I think, you know, I'm not arguing that that's a criticism of the book per se, but I think more of that's really what we should be focusing on much more in terms of looking forward and how do we actually bring China to negotiate on the things that bother us about China, but there has to be a quid pro quo. We need to be talking about things that bother China about us, right? And that's part of the game, of course. And I think a lot of what is happening in the EU is essentially trying to create more negotiating chips to induce the Chinese to come and sit around the table, right? So procurements, investment screening, uh, export restrictions on you know, technology sensitive stuff. Uh, this case you mentioned for Egypt, right? So indirect subsidization. All of this, I think we need to see this as part of an effort. And of course, this falls under the strategic autonomy kind of slogan in Brussels, but it's all a way of kind of, okay, we're going to kind of create more incentives for China to actually sit down with us and to negotiate with us. So all fine. I, I kind of echo what Lucas said. I also found the uh, go CP TPP message a bit, uh, shall I say, uh, too American centric. So I th so that's something we, we can talk about. But I think one of the things, and this is a bit, I guess, something you guys didn't have a chance to really reflect on, there is a different approach in the comprehensive agreement on investment, right? Now that thing is probably dead as a doornail for political reasons, but there is a different approach. So as Luca mentioned, SOEs aren't mentioned, but that's not because SOEs are not part of the picture. SOEs are very much part of the picture, but they took a different approach, you know, through this covered entity type of concept. And that might be a more, if I, I think that might be a better way of actually thinking of approaching the issue. One reason for that is that China actually agreed to it, right? It's written down there. Um, I think the big problem with the CPTPP approach independent of the Chinese saying we might want to join. I don't see that happening anytime soon. But the problem is, you know, it is very much, it's there. They weren't involved in negotiating those rules, whereas they were involved in negotiating the, the common agreement on investment. So I think looking forward, and again, this is not a criticism of the book because this all happened uh, relatively recently. We need to think about kind of different models and in particular ones where China has already signaled that it's okay in terms of a particular path forward. But I think the key two messages I think I would leave is we need to have a balance here and we need to broaden this agenda. So it's not just about SOEs and, and forced technology transfer. I, I was a bit surprised in the book how much attention was given to forced technology transfer. And clearly one reason is, is because everybody in Washington and Brussels was talking about this. But I really see this as a complete non-issue, right? Any firm that goes into China walks in with eyes wide open. They know exactly what the deal is. So why we should then say, okay, well, we don't like <laughs> the, the environment in which they have to operate. You know, we have the same thing in the Gulf, in Saudi Arabia. There's lots of countries which, which have these joint venture type requirements. If we really think that is a problem, we need an investment agreement. We need to negotiate that. And in a sense, I think that's what you say. But I, I really don't buy it as being a big issue. Um, and that leads to my second point in terms of preparing the ground for negotiations, which has to be much broader than these two issues that are uh, emphasized in the book. We need to do a lot more work. We need to do a lot more homework. Uh, and this is something Doug and I have been banging on about uh, for quite a bit. You need to prepare the ground. There needs to be an evidence base. There needs to be analysis that actually identifies what's first order, what's second order, what is essentially irrelevant uh, in terms of creating large spillovers for the trading system, large spillovers in terms of competitiveness. And you know, at the end of the day, sure, there's a lot of research on the SOE front, for example, showing that SOEs are less productive. But I haven't seen a whole lot of research actually that says, you know, the behavior of these SOEs actually creates really large, significant negative competitive spillovers. And, you know, if I was 
you know, that's what I would want to see. Where is it? And of course, we can generate that. But what really strikes me is that we haven't really had that effort undertaken to date. It's been very legalistic, right? So it's sorry to all the lawyers on the call, but you know, it's all about okay, we have the agreement on subsidies, countervailing measures. How can we kind of improve uh, the application of what we have there? So there's all this talk about public body. But at the end of the day, I would argue we need a lot more economics. We need a lot more political economy. And we really need to identify what is important as opposed to things that are much less so. And it really has to focus on spillovers. And that has to go way beyond the SOE technology transfer front because there are a lot of other issues that are really much bigger in terms of the potential for spillovers. And I think climate change trade is a good example of one that comes to mind. I think the tax issue is another one that comes to mind. So yes, that is being discussed in the OECD, but we have yet to see where that is going to end up. <clears throat> so let me, let me end with that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bernard. And uh, thanks all the speakers and of course, Petros uh, in chief for their interventions. In the interest of time, of which we don't have too much as we would have, I would propose, and I would also uh, agree because in the chair I can command the situation, that we open now the floor for questions. And then, of course, um, uh, while the speakers get to answer, there might be an occasion or two for rebuttals and cross comments. But I think uh, our audience needs to be rewarded with some 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 uh, uh, some place on center stage. So uh, if you if you if you want, just use the little hands up icon. I will see that and I will call you in. Anybody who wants to come in, of course, uh, um, you, you you you're you're free to go. I will unmute you when you come in. I can see a lot of people that might have questions and. The time is running, so don't be shy. While people gather up their courage, can I ask Petros whether he has any reactions to what have been said by all the panelists? That might be a good occasion for people to just... Uh, um, Take some courage and come in next. Petros, do you want to make a two minutes comment? Uh, Sorry, before Petros starts, where is this hand raising thing? It's a, it's a, it's a, there's a, there's an icon called reactions on the bottom row. It's next to share. And if you click on the smiley face, then several okay. other reactions appear, including raise hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Petrus, do you want to do a two-minute reaction while I, we wait? I, I, can do, I, I can do 90 seconds. Uh, Very good. I'll make four points. In the first, the book is not about what we think is important, as I said. The book is about what the trading community thinks is important. And we use two proxies. We use disputes before the WTO and we use disputes before committees. And if you take these two together, close to 71% concern two issues. SOE is transfer of technology. Now, this might be unimportant for academics, fine. It's very important to the trading community, obviously. On uh, Lucas points, quite frankly, I don't see where we disagree uh, because uh, we spoke, as you can imagine, Andres Shapiro is an EU insider. We spent a lot of time discussing the EU Vietnam, which we mentioned it in the agreement. The EU Vietnam was modeled after CPTPP, as you know, because it, was, it came right after TPP. And by the way, at the time it was modeled after CPTPP, there was a declared intention by China to join the TPP, not something like EU, Vietnam. Kai, we had no idea it happened after we published the book. So uh, I don't see what is the, where is, and why it is so different, the EU, Vietnam from the TPP. I mean, quite, to accuse me, fine, you can accuse me for whatever you want, but to accuse Andre for being EU eccentric, I think it goes, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, um, uh, moreover, um, the ambassador of New Zealand who was with us and uh, one of the guys who interviewed a lot, he said clearly that the, CPP, the CPTPP discipline is something China could live with based on discussions they had and we cited in the book. So this is why we have this preference for CPTPP and for no other reason, not because we don't like Europe and we like the US more. We might like the US more for other reasons, but not for this. 
Um, uh, on uh, Julia's point, very quickly, I mean, uh, the CPTPP, we use it for Article 17, Julia, not for, uh, not for subsidies. Subsidies, we believe, as I said 10 times, it's a mess. The case law destroyed everything. They went from here, there to anywhere. They didn't use any of the points you made. And the, our benchmark to judge how much you can go is case law, law plus case law. Law plus case law is what you've seen. Public bodies goes black one day, white the next day. This is where we are, unfortunately. Uh, if you can, if another lawyer would have done it a different way, fine. And on transfer of technology, we don't disagree again. All we say is to the extent that you deal with private action, there's nothing you can do about it. And I think this is a point, I mean, we cannot disagree either. If it is action attributable to government, it's a different story. On the liberal understanding, which is the biggest disagreement, I mean, I heard the biggest criticism I heard about our book. I, it's one of the few occasions I humbly disagree with my dear friend, Doug Nelson from whom I've learned a lot and I hope to continue to learn. This is not how I read the gut story. When I look into the gut story, I see two people sitting at the table, James Smith on the one side and on the other side, one American guy, Bill Clayton. Now the discussion, 76 out of 85 provisions of the Atlantic Charter, which is a bilateral agreement, are the gut. So it's not a liberal understanding of Brussels, Belgium, Holland, no. These guys didn't even speak. It is two countries, UA, UK, US. Now, Article 17 is clearly drafted as an exception, except to the basic disciplines, because national treatment, for example, cannot function without market economy. That's the liberal understanding. How on earth can you have national treatment if you don't have trading rights? So if I am a complete monopoly, I cannot use the basic gut. I'm out. So this is precisely why Article 17 comes in place 17 and not in one or three. And it is very narrowly drafted, and it is crystal clear that what they want to do in Article 17 is they want to impose on those guys to behave like private agents. That's precisely why they say commercial considerations 20 times in the, in the body of the provision, which the appellate body in its infinite wisdom uh, oversaw. So to us, the liberal understanding in the 40s, and that's what we talk about, in the 40s, was there. It was the foundation of the gut. And we're not the only guys who say that. We didn't invent this story. I mean, Tumler, the young Tumler, who was the chief economist of the gut, wrote two great papers exactly about the same point. We quote him, actually. Now, is this liberal understanding shared nowadays? We believe not. And that's precisely why we criticize the negotiation of China. Because at the moment when China is about to join the WTO, in our view, for whatever our view is worth, of course, the WTO should have adopted the attitude of Barack Obama and redo the subsidies agreement in a way to tighten the screws around the Chinese state intervention. We don't disagree at all, actually, neither with you nor with Lucas, that that the obvious way to discuss it so is in subsidies. We don't say the opposite. We say exactly the opposite. We say this is where you should discuss it. But we say when we pay attention in our, in your view inordinate to SOEs. Because this is the complaint of the WTO members. The WTO members don't complain about let's reduce up this agreement. This is the place where the negotiation will take place. The WTO members are upset because of the role of SOEs and transfer of technology predominantly. And the last point I will make, and I will stop with this, when it comes, I spent a lot of time with my dear friend Damian Evan looking into the negotiation on environmental goods. We did a paper one and a half years ago. China made very substantial, we found China, actually it goes against everything Bagwell Steger stands for, this negotiation, because China agreed to make the most dramatic tariff cuts on environmental goods. It was probably the best pupil in, in, the, in the room. Now, they don't speak too much about China and climate. We didn't find any, anyone say, oh, oh they don't protect the environment. No, They're precisely because China was a very good participant in this negotiation. In this negotiation, as I said, 71% of complaints focus around those issues, and we took it for granted. That's why we wrote the book. And that's why we are launching it today and present it to the wider world. Thank you very much, Petros, for the reactions. I renew my invitation.